Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And um, I want to start really by asking what art is for, because at the end of the day, the region we put advertising in is quite close to this other big category we have called art. And I just want to ask why art exists. Big question, um, still early enough in the day that we can uh, plow through this one. Well, I think part of the reason is we don't know how to regulate our moods. We are very mood unstable, so we're constantly drifting out of the sort of moods that we want to hold on to and drifting towards moods that we don't uh, particularly want to, to be in. Um, and the other thing that is very fundamental to the human animal is that we're extremely forgetful. Um, we have commitments to which we feel extremely wedded at nine o'clock in the morning. By five o'clock in the afternoon, we might have completely have uh, deserted them. This is why religions have always been based on the idea of repetition that what you need to do if you're trying to get a message across to somebody is repeat it constantly. Um, because it's got nothing to do with intelligence. It's got to do with the leakiness of our minds. And um, the ancient Greeks had a lovely term called acrasia, which they defined as weakness of will. And the reason why they were obsessed by this is that they noticed that all of us can have good and big ideas in our minds about being honorable people or virtuous parents or good citizens. And then as we go through our lives, it's not that we abandon these ideas theoretically, but they cease to be effective practically at uh, key moments of our lives. So um, it's really on this basis that we find, I think, a utility for art, because art at its best is a mechanism to remind us of those ideas that we feel deep down most wedded to, uh, but are also constantly prone to drift away from. So it's a sort of mood anchoring uh, uh, machine. The German philosopher Hegel said that art is the sensuous presentation of important ideas. Now, that word sensuous, what he meant by this is that really human beings are sensory, that the, an enormous part of the way that we learn and take ideas on board is through our senses. We're constantly prone to underplay this and to forget the role of the senses in our acquisition of knowledge. And of course, the category uh, of people who are most prone to forget this are philosophers who um, are, are constantly feeling that the way to persuade an audience is through rational means. So Hegel, writing uh, in the early 19th century, was fascinated by the way in which philosophers, he observed, had had very little traction, actually, over thousands of years of operation. It's not that their ideas were wrong. It's that their ideas were not presented in a sensory enough manner. And he contrasted the ineffectiveness of uh, philosophy with the powerful effectiveness of religion. And he was fascinated by the way that religions are not merely mechanisms that pump out ideas. I mean, in any religion, there are a whole set of ideas. Um, but uh, most of the world's religions are extremely interested in persuasion. And it's because they're interested in persuasion that they get interested in art. They feel very accurately um, that in order to get a message across, it helps to have a nice building. It helps that your clothes are correct. It, hope, it helps that you've got some music going on. Uh, it helps that you're manipulating space in, in a certain way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, recently I, I had some uh, uh, chats with um, an organisation called the British Humanist Association, and they came to see us at the School of Life. And their basic message was: we don't understand why over 50% of the UK population identifies as atheist or secular, and yet when it comes to the big moments of their life they always head off to the church um, or the mosque or wherever, um, but predominantly the church they were, they were targeting uh, or, or thinking about. Um, and why is this? And the gentleman who came to see me had a very large, luxuriant beard, pair of sandals, old pair of clothes. I just thought I'd be a little rude. I said, look, do you know that when you go into a church, the clothes that people are wearing have been thought about so rigorously over hundreds of years that the spaces... I said to him, where do you hold your humanist services? And he said, well, often in offices that are not being used on weekends, so the hallway of offices. I said, oh, right, that's striking that people don't want to get married in, in such large numbers in the hallways of offices, etc." The point I'm, coming, uh, I'm trying to make is that the way in which we touch the senses is absolutely crucial to the way that messages are going to get across. Um, and that really you can look at all works of art as containing at one level an idea 
and at another level, a wrapper of a kind of sensory um, pill uh, that will get across to the audience. So, you know, take an abstract notion like the idea that it's nice to be kind to other people or that we're all one and we should all love one another. Now, if somebody says that to you, you just think, well, I don't know. But imagine you're listening to the radio and you're driving down the motorway and Hey Jude comes on and you're feeling in a kind of sour mood, your, your, your mood has, has, has spun towards a rather negative direction. The song starts, you're kind of resistant to it, but by about minute three, you're being won over. And by minute four or five, I think it's, it's up to five and a half minutes, that song, um, you know, you're waving at other people on, the, uh, on, on the, the lanes of the motorway because suddenly you rediscover what the song is doing is reconnecting you to a part of yourself that was dormant but present, but had been able, but had, had kind of become somnolent because of other things that had happened to you. So art constantly functions as this mechanism of reminder. And the more valuable the message that we're being reminded of, the more valuable um, we take the work of art uh, 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 to be. Um, the the, uh, the, the, the um, Czech Austrian, uh, Czech German writer Franz Kafka said that the role, the purpose of art, and he thought particularly of music, um, but he said art in general is to take an ice pick to the heart. And what does that mean? It really means that our hearts do freeze over, that our emotional life, um, a lot of life, a lot of what we call professional life, you know, what, what, what's, what's the difference between private life and professional life? Professional life basically means that you can't cry, that you can't feel, that you can't confess to vulnerability. Um, a lot of what you are has to become frozen over in order to get through your existence. Um, and that's very effective, and um, I think it's a sentimental illusion to suppose that we don't need to do that. We do need some ice, but we also need to know how to break through that ice at key points, otherwise there will be other dangers. And so the argument is that um, at certain moments we are in extreme need of having that ice broken, and works of art, music especially, but other kinds of art as well, are that extremely powerful way in which we can get back to emotions that we've locked ourselves out of. Now, I know that many of you are in the advertising business, so let's, let's approach a ticklish subject, which is advertising is sometimes quite annoying to people. Um, and let's think about why it's annoying and when it's annoying. What's it doing when it's annoying? Um, okay, here are, some here are some examples of some adverts that have frustrated in interesting ways and also in a way annoyed me. Not particularly radio, uh, though some of them have got radio elements to them. But do you remember that? Uh, there was a campaign for Campari many years ago now, Campari, uh, and it showed uh, groups of friends holding hands, hugging, going out, having a lovely time together. And the strap line was, and this was used on radio and in, in print um, very widely, um, and the strap line was always Campari and friends. Lovely idea. And many people um, would perhaps have been tempted to buy a crate of Campari and return home to their apartment and crack them open. Now, what they would have found is that when they were cracking open their Campari, um, there was one thing missing, uh, and that is their friends. There were no friends. They were quite lonely. So they'd be drinking Campari on their own. But the reason why they'd be motivated by, uh, by, to buy Campari was, of course, the evocation of their desire for friendship. And this is a big problem. And look. Many adverts do this. Let's look at this squarely in the face. Remember that advert for, for Dove? Uh, and it said, it was Dove and then uh, hyphen calm. So calm is something that we love so much. And it, there were various versions of this. There was a woman lying in the bath uh, with bubbles everywhere. She looked so peaceful, so serene, etc. cetera. Um, and many iterations of this. But the basic message was, buy this soap and you will get this thing called calm. Now, calm is one of the most desirable things. All of us are you know, shaking with anxiety most of the time, and yet somehow this soap was promising you that you would get calm. Think of that advert for, uh, that um, uh, Land Rover, Range Rover did a few years ago for the Freelander, and it had the word freedom everywhere. Freedom was constantly being pumped out at us, and it showed this very muscular Jeep just plowing through forests and up uh, dunes and, 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 and through rugged terrain. And again, the danger was that we would go out and buy the car and sit in traffic in our own lives, so lacking in freedom, that we'd buy the soap and still be you know, reckless with anxiety, um, despite the presence of many of these bars, uh, etc. and ditto with the Campari. In other words, what many of the most successful adverts do is store up trouble for everybody, um, because in a short-term gain for their own product, they are eroding 
the implicit trust that the audience has in advertising more generally. And because it's been going on for a while, you know, let's remember that advertising um, of this kind, which is what some people call emotional advertising, in other words, it identifies emotional components that we really want and need, and it connects them up, sometimes in quite arbitrary ways, but very seductive ways with products and services that, in a sense, have nothing to do with them. Um, so remember those lovely Patek Philippe adverts are still, still running, been running about 20 years. Lovely Patek Philippe adverts um, showing fathers and sons and mothers and daughters, uh, and then there's a watch. Now, the reason why those adverts are so moving is that so many of us have such troubled relations with our parents and our children. And in some way, this watch, these watch, this watch campaign subliminally targets those anxieties and promises us a solution. Um, and the problem is that Patek Philippe, even though they make wonderful timepieces, have in no way been able to address the real reasons why people don't get on with their children and children don't get on with their parents, which is one of the greatest challenges that humanity can undertake. But somehow this very vigorous Swiss corporation has no interest in it. So advertisers know what we need. They just refuse to sell it to us very often. And this stores up problems. Um, there's a wonderful Greek uh, philosopher called Epicurus. And back in the third century BC, Epicurus studied what would make people happy. And he became an ex expert of his day, future laboratory of his day, in happiness. Um, and um, he quickly acquired a very bad reputation because without people reading his books, this often happens to people, people imagined that they knew what the guy was saying. So when he said, you know, I'm, a, I'm an expert in happiness, they imagined orgies, uh, lots of money, uh, and parties all night long, and just decadence. And that's why the word Epicurean is still, still in the dictionary as suggesting decadence. Uh, and uh, a, a kind of ornate lotus-eating lifestyle because of this basic misunderstanding. Now, the truth about Epicurus was much more sober. And actually, he was interested in happiness, but once he drilled into it, he believed that there were only three things that you really needed, and that if you had those, you would not in any way be interested in money, fame, power, large houses, etc. And those three things were, one, very touchingly, friends. And that's why Epicurus started the world's first commune, uh, guess who did his PhD on Epicurus? Karl Marx. Karl Marx, Marxism is essentially a version of Epicureanism, dressed up, bit of 19th century economics, didn't really work, bolted on. But basically, it's Epicureanism for the 19th century. Um, and uh, what he was saying was, uh, let's live together, because that hugely reduces our anxiety. So there were Epicurean communities. At the height of the movement, there were 3,000 of these communities all around the Mediterranean eventually snuffed out by Christianity, but um, it, it thrived for hundreds of years. Um, you need friends. The other thing you need is independence, freedom from oppressive forces, uh, bosses, etc. So they downsized these guys, and they were raising their own vegetables and animals uh, and getting away from centralized authorities and living by themselves in a, a, a commune. The other thing they were dedicated to was achieving a calm state of mind an anxiety-free state of mind through conscious, uh, constant examination of their mentalities. So they would be doing what we would nowadays call probably psychotherapy. Um, and they were going through anxieties, particularly relating to death, which was a big concern uh, in their days and ours. And uh, they had all sorts of views for how to calm people down around death. Now, the specifics don't necessarily matter, but what we're seeing is, and this is absolutely central really to the history of philosophy, is that there are lots and lots of things that we want and then there are a few things that we really need. And if you manage to get hold of the things you really need, you'll have, much, uh, you'll, you'll have many fewer uh, idle wants. That the desire for lots of stuff, unlimited stuff, um, is something that really flows from a lack of self-knowledge. The more you understand yourself, um, the less tempted you will be by many of the things that are on offer. Now, this is kind of difficult for advertising, and I think we should admit it to ourselves, and this is one of the problems of capitalism, really. It's not that advertising is just one symptomatic area within capitalism, but you know, capitalism, in a sense, never wondered why we should be consuming the things we're consuming. The point is that consumption is good, and you leave consumption up to the individual consumer. The thing is that the individual consumer doesn't necessarily know that well what they need. Now, I'm not saying that anyone else, let alone central government, and a member of the government has just arrived, <laughs> government definitely doesn't know what we need either. But it's worth holding in mind that the idea of individuals who fully know what they need is wrong. 
We know, we know, we recognize this in children. When children suddenly say, I need the new PS4, I need lots of chocolate, etc. As a parent, you're constantly going, well, that's interesting you have that feeling, um, but I'm not sure it's necessarily aligned with your best long-term interests. Um, and then you have an argument. And, but essentially, um, there is a parental distrust of the child's first impulses. Maybe the child hasn't understood themselves properly. And the role of being a parent is to interpret the child's confused wants and try and tug them back to their true and sincere needs. Um, now, once you reach the age of 18, that role stops. And it's not because uh, we necessarily have an end to the need for this kind of guidance. It's just that we haven't found a way of delivering it in a way that doesn't seem oppressive, nannying, or plain spooky. Um, nevertheless, we do continue to need it. And this is why our cupboards are full of th things that we don't want anymore. This is why we've bought a car that actually we think is now ridiculous. Uh, this is why we go on holiday and it doesn't deliver the happiness we want, etc. Consumption is a veil of tears from many points of view. We are constantly buying the wrong things. And this is delightful for advertisers because they can confuse us even more about what it is that we really want. But I keep coming back to this. They're storing up trouble. Um, because at the end of the day, I believe in an honourable version of capitalism, um, because I think, you know, very often if you go to the left of the political spectrum, you'll find people who basically have a view of human beings that human beings don't need anything at all. Um, now, I'm not, I believe that in, in order to be properly happy, you actually need quite a lot of things. I'm not with Epicurus. I don't think you just need friends, calm, and freedom. You also need some nice clothes, some interesting food, some interesting journeys, something interesting to read. You know, the list is very, very long. So I don't believe that most of the industries that are currently operating are idle or worthless. And I think, in fact, we're only just getting going with delivering people the things that they actually uh, need. Um, so it's not about anti-consumption. It's simply about trying to unite people more accurately with the things that they genuinely need. And I think that many advertisers, so scared are they um, of, in a way, the, um, the, 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 their products don't really fit into anyone's life that they do that thing which is anchor their product to something that is not really in the product but is, happens to be appealing. So that's why so many adverts are around sexuality in one form or another uh, and things that are very different. Garden hoses, wheelbarrows, pencils, shampoo, they are all rather arbitrarily connected um, to, uh, uh, to something that of course we're interested in but um, that has nothing really to do with shampoo. Uh, or only really very distantly. And this, as I say, stores up trouble. So um, what I'd like to sketch, and I think you know, advertising has a lot to learn from art. This is one of the themes that I want to d discuss today because there's a lot that's in common between good art and good advertising. We often see, often artists are very sniffy about advertising and advertisers think of themselves quite modestly in relation to artists, but there's, you can really build a lot of bridges. Now, one of the things that um, art has learned to be but advertising perhaps hasn't yet learned to be, is unidealistic. Now, recently I was in the Netherlands, and I was looking at the Netherlands uh, tourist board adverts of the country. And you know the kind of thing. It was pristine canals, it was blue skies, uh, it was lovely windmills on a, a sunny day, etc. Now, those of you who know the Netherlands well, know that it rains pretty much every day in, in that country. Um, and you'll probably also know something else. It's a really nice country. So this, tell, this is telling us something. It's telling us about the anxiety of the Netherlands Tourist Board. The Dutch Tourist Board doesn't believe in the actual virtues of the country it's representing. And so therefore, it is tempted to do that thing that sometimes one does in adverts, which is exaggerate. And exaggeration stores up trouble. Now, what these, should, what these guys should, do, should have done is gone to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam where, and looked up this lovely painter called Van Rysdale, who spent his uh, years in the 17th century painting um, the Dutch countryside. But it's almost always raining in Van Rysdale's works. Uh, the canals are quite muddy. Um, there are a few flowers, but often they've been trampled by a cow. Uh, and uh, there are some houses, but they're a bit rickety. And there are windmills, but the, the, the plaster's not that pristine, etc. And the thing is, it doesn't matter. It's really attractive. You know, if you, if you sell one of these paintings, I mean, Van Rysdale recently went on sale in New York, 50 million euros. So 50 million euros for showing you the Dutch countryside, not as we'd like it to be, but as it actually is. This is very hopeful news. This means that all of us, are extremely capable of appreciating things which are less than perfect. And the reason why we know that this is true is that we love our families. 
even though they're all extremely imperfect, uh, especially our children and our parents, and we love them anyway, even though they're a bit beaten up and they've got very annoying habits and all the rest of it, we love them still. The human animal is deeply capable of ambivalent love. And this, yet somehow advertisers, in a moment of nervousness, forget this. Um, advertising, for me, is it's most seductive when it remembers it. Remember those lovely uh, adverts by Bill Burback, I think, in 1964, lovely adverts that he did for VW in America, America's slowest fastback. They announced the Beetle um, with America, you know, those pictures that were essentially underestimating the qualities of the VW Beetle. So charming to say, um, I mean, after all, we, we all know this. Um, even Americans know this is sometimes missed. Um, underplaying the virtues of something is a really good way of winning over an audience. To say, actually, look, my watch is not that good. It's not that good. Or indeed, my speech is not that good. People go, oh, actually, no, it's all right. You know, go, it's absolutely terrible, etc. It's a good way to, to get somebody on side. We forget this um, in a kind of moment of anxiety. Um, think of the Japanese and their wonderful discovery that they put their, this word, this term on the map uh, in a wonderful way in the 17th century, wabi-sabi. Um, the, uh, uh, the concept of wabi-sabi is this idea that within Japanese aesthetics that that which is old, which is rugged, which is slightly beaten up, which has been tarnished by age and time is not to be neglected. It is in fact more valuable than the pristine and the clean, etc. Um, and again, this is an insight with enormous repercussions for the way in which we trade goods with one another that perfection doesn't need to be important. Remember how the Japanese also have this concept of kintsugi, the broken potter, broken ceramic tradition, where when you break a pot uh, in certain schools in Japan, uh, schools of thought, you don't necessarily throw it away and think that's the end of that. You fix it. And the fixed pot is more valuable than the unbroken pot because the fixed pot is alive to something that is true of all of us, which is we're a bit broken. So by reconciling us to the truth of who we are, um, the work of art is honoring our human nature and therefore winning us over and getting, its allegi getting our allegiance. The other thing that um, advertisers st are still doing a lot of and art has learned not to do is to be sentimental. Um, 19th century art, the reason why we n mostly can't help but slightly giggle when we read a 19th century novel of uh, the, not the top rate or look at 19th century art not of the top rate is that it's almost stiflingly sentimental. What is sentimentality? Sentimentality, well, Oscar Wilde said sentimentality is the desire to feed off an emotion without paying for it. And really what he meant is life is fundamentally ambivalent. There is the good and the bad, the light and the dark. And the, uh, a sentimental person refuses to admit space for the dark side of the equation. So, you know, the, the, the painting in, in um, I think it's in the, it's in the uh, Tate in Liverpool, uh, a painting called Henry Frick called The Village Wedding. Incredibly sunny day and everybody's come out to play and it's the village wedding and a beautiful couple are going to get married and there's an old man looking fondly at the couple. It's all absolutely perfect. Of course, anyone who's married and anyone who's not knows that marriage is not like this. Um, and that's real trouble because we keep holding up to our own examination images of how life is, which is not how life is, which actually leaves everybody feeling paranoid, lonely, and persecuted because our reality doesn't match the reality it's supposed uh, to, to, to be at. So I think what, you know, artists have learned in the 20th century that if you want to be taken seriously and if you want to have an effect on your audience, admitting the light and the dark, um, the negative and the positive, uh, is a wonderful way to do it. Um, advertising has a long, long way uh, uh, to go. Um, the other thing, fascinated by our last speaker who mentioned the word melancholy, um, you know, 50% of us, according to Susan Cain, um, great psychologist on this topic and, and theorist on this topic, 50% of us are introverts. Now, what are introverts? Introverts like to be quiet. They're suspicious of groups. They don't like to hold hands with large numbers of people and cheer. They, they're suspicious of a group enthusiasm of any kind. They like to be by themselves. They like to be quiet. And they're so aware always of uh, uh, the slightly somber side of existence. Bless them. I'm one of them. Um, bless introverts, right? Your half of the room is, is, is uh, introverted. Advertisers have forgotten there are such things as introverts, um, and uh, particularly radio advertising. I mean, you know, I was talking to some people about radio advertising the other day, and they said, the thing about uh, radio advertising, there's the jingle, the advert that sounds very cheerful. So advertising, partly because of its roots in the 70s and 80s, there, were, uh, there was a lot of tone of upbeat cheerfulness. And you know, this lovely uh, uh, um, uh, Chinese advert for the, for the chocolate bar, 
we don't need to be cheerful to seduce an audience. You need to be honest and true to what human nature is, and human nature is spends a lot of its time in states of melancholy of one kind or another. You're seeking to make an emotional connection with someone. And that emotional connection, you have to find your audience where they happen to be, which might be in a slightly solemn uh, uh, state. You know, the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott said that one of the worst things that you can do with a baby is, uh, in his words, he's a wonderfully down-to-earth, so pungent uh, English writer, um, is to jolly a baby along. And you know what happens with, with some people who don't really have experience of children or indeed of their own emotions is they'll see a baby and they go, oh, it's a baby. So babies are cheerful. So therefore, I will pick up the baby and play peekaboo with the baby, even though even if it's tired or feeling slightly melancholic or its eyes are a little distant or sad about because children and babies have lots of deep thoughts about separation and all sorts of things, which means that they're not always in a good mood, and nor should they be. Um, but sometimes we insist that they have to be in a good mood, probably because our own darker moods have not been properly digested and uh, uh, lived through. And therefore, we insist on picking up the baby and playing peekaboo uh, and trying to shake some laughter out of this child who needs to be sunny. Uh, it's not that we want to make it sunny. It, we need that child to be sunny to fulfill certain uh, of our own unprocessed uh, uh, kind of emotions. This is a very bad thing to do because it leads people to disassociate from their own emotions because that baby will grow up into a person who thinks, um, in order to be a good citizen and a good person, I constantly have to smile. Uh, whereas, in fact, we don't always have to smile. There are, there are periods for melancholy and mourning and sadness. These are parts of human experience as well. And so often, as I say, the advertising spectrum, and I think radio advertising is particularly guilty of this, though has no need to be, because as we saw in the last speaker, there are so many possibilities for the darkness, the silence, the rustling, uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the quiet of the night to come across the airwaves. All of this is eminently possible, but somehow we don't necessarily give uh, advertisers, uh, 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 the audience, the credit uh, that, they, that they would need. Um, look, ultimately, um, uh, radio advertising and advertising more generally is part of the modern economy, which, um, you know, let's have an upbeat message really about uh, uh, the economy and capitalism. Um, it's very often said we're in a period of stagnation, we're in a period of economic stagnation where economies around the world are not growing. And very often this is connected up uh, by analysts to a feeling that enormous gains in productivity have meant that we simply, in many product areas, we have what we need. So Apple sales are flatlining, Toyota's sales are flatlining, Siemens' sales are flatlining, because we have the consumer products, the transport mechanisms, etc., that these people are offering. So we've got sort of enough that the giant factories of the world have satisfied all of our needs. This is nonsense. And the reason it's nonsense is that you're unhappy. And you're unhappy because there are lots of things that you need that you haven't been able to find a product for or a service for. Um, and you can start the list. I mean, when people say, you know, capitalism is finished and we've got everything we need, et cetera, et cetera, just run through an average day and think of the areas in which you have what you need and the areas where you don't have what you need. Um, so you might start off in the morning, uh, you get up in the morning, you go to the kitchen and uh, you open the cupboard and there are six packets of cereal uh, staring at you. And in fact, on the aisles of supermarkets, there are hundred varieties of cereal. We have enough cereal. Please don't make any more cereal. We've got enough. We've done that. Uh, if you're young and seeking to start a business, don't start a cereal business. We've done it. We've, we've covered that area. But then, shortly after, your partner comes down. And they have a slightly odd tone in their voice. And you go, what's wrong? And they go, I don't know. Was anything wrong with you? No, I don't know. And within a few minutes, you're in one of those slightly touchy encounters that just sets the day off in a sort of odd. You really need to crank up the radio to find a cheerful tune after that. And yet, somehow, the, the emotion is unresolved. Where do you go? You could turn up at, uh, you know, uh, any supermarket, you would not find anything on the shelf for the tetchy mood that you've had with your partner. And on and on it goes. Many of our deepest needs, our need for friendship, community, belonging, purpose, all of these things it, are not currently served by capitalism. And this has led some people on the left to say that's because they are not commercial products. Nonsense. Of course they are. Everything is a commercial product in the sense that it is something that one person can provide for another person. That is a commercial product. Um, Remember Abraham Maslow's famous pyramid of needs. Most of the economy is still down at the bottom of that pyramid. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid comes the satisfaction of our basic need for food and shelter and transport and communication. We're taking good care of that. Most of the you know, FTSE 100 are companies taking care of our needs at the bottom of the pyramid of, of needs. As we start climbing up the pyramid, you get weirder words, words like belonging, friendship, 
freedom, independence, what odd things, right? And you might think, well, what can we possibly do here? My prediction for the economy, and this is going to include advertising, is we'll start to climb that pyramid in time because there is no historic reason why we should be tr trading uh, products that we don't really believe in and making profits from things we don't really believe in. The, a good economy is one where we are properly satisfying the underlying appetites of other human beings. And we think we can do that and make money. There is absolutely no conflict between the two. And we've started to see this happening. And a lot of this is going to happen through technology. So think of Facebook. Facebook is now worth, I think, $23 billion. And it's the first company that's really addressing fairly and squarely a need right at the top of Abraham Maslow's pyramid of need, the need for friendship. Right? So it's a company. Now, you could fault it all sorts of things, but it's basically targeting our need for friendship and making many, many billion dollars every year on the back of that. That is, I think, a very encouraging sign because for a long time, Campari and others were simply saying, there's the drink and friends, let's stick it together arbitrarily. And then along came Facebook and said, you know what? You could maybe actually just go and have the friends directly. You know, it doesn't matter about the Campari. Um, and I think we're going to see that same move in a lot of areas. Um, let me tell you just a very brief anecdote. Six months ago, I was called up by a man called Brian Chesky. Never heard of him. And he, um, he said to me, um, I run a company called Airbnb. So I perked up a bit. And I said, oh, right, um, what, 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 what do you want? What can I do for you? And he said, well, I've, I've read your stuff. And I, I'm interested in flying you over to um, talk to my conference in San Francisco next week. Uh, and anyway, he persuaded me by various inducements. I flew over to San Francisco, met with the guy. He is a fascinating man because he's done a survey of people's satisfaction levels on their holidays. And the answers are world-shaking because basically holidays tend to go wrong. Travels tend to go wrong. Most people, over 70% of journeys don't go as they're supposed to have gone. Um, and the travel industry keeps selling us all these promises of calm, of friendship, of reconnection, of romance, etc., But um, it doesn't necessarily deliver. And this has become, Brian Chesky of Airbnbs, uh, um, this has become his obsession. How can we make travel deliver on its implicit promises? And you will see, I can't reveal much more, but I've been working with him on this, you will see in about a year's time an entirely new business grow out of Air, growing out of Airbnb. Airbnb at the moment, as he says himself, is just putting people on a pillow, uh, putting their heads on pillows. It's not particularly complex and it's not theoretically complicated. The next venture that this man makes is going to be to try and unite the highest goals that we have of travel, which at the end of the day is to be happy in a lot of deep ways, um, to actually make, make sure that the mechanisms that we use when we go traveling and the destinations we choose are properly wired up to those higher goals. It's a fascinating move. And we're seeing it in many areas. When I was in California, I also had the pleasure of meeting a man called Reid Hoffman, who runs LinkedIn. And he happened to do a PhD on Aristotle at Oxford University before starting up LinkedIn. And he's fascinated by the deeper purpose of his business. And he knows that LinkedIn in its present form is not doing what it really should be doing, which is to understand its, um, uh, uh, it, it, those who browse the site looking for work and also those who are offering work. It knows that it really it's just a CV matching system, whereas what it should really be doing is have an ability to peer inside your heart and soul as a worker, understand your true potential, train you up in the ways that you really need to be trained in order to release your full potential, and then find the employer for you that will honor your largest hopes for yourself. Now that's, as it were, the biggest possible dream of what LinkedIn could be. It isn't that yet. It could be partly through the use of artificial intelligence and a lot of the work that's going on in neuroscience. We're going to be able to move away from a kind of, if you excuse the word, a bullshit economy towards a sincere economy, an honorable economy that is actually delivering things that people really want. The exciting thing for advertising, I think, is that there is now more than ever no need to lie to the audience. Um, confident advertisers know the true virtues of their products, are able to present those to their audiences in ways that don't excite needs which can't then be fulfilled and then there's blowback uh, onto the product or advertising more generally. Um, this can be done. Radio is a supreme medium in which to do it. Um, there's ex lots to be hopeful for in advertising in general, radio in particular, and capitalism as a whole. Thank you very much.